Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I am here with... My name is Ian Sharp, and I am the uh, author of When the Wolf Comes, as well as a whole bunch of Viking verse novels. Thank you, Manny, for having me on. Yes, and I'm so glad I get a chance to talk to you. Something about Viking history and Norse mythology that has always intrigued me. And looking at this book, I have to admit, it gives me really strong... Um, I hope this is not to sound weird, but but Jack Kirby vibes, because yeah, yeah. Jack Kirby, um, uh, you know, created these like uh, the you know this mythology of these space gods, yep. and and this is a really interesting um, idea of of incorporating Viking, you know, the, the the culture, the lore, everything about it into science fiction, which I think has really uh, such a unique take on it. Um, so. Let's start at the beginning. Where, where did the idea for this come from? It's funny you should say, let's start at the beginning. I mean, every good story has to start at the beginning, but literally, the first words of the novel, the all-father paradox behind me, is in the beginning. Because the, the, the kind of story is set in this alternate timeline where the Vikings rule the sea and the stars. And one of the bylines I've put is, is they put Christianity to the Viking sword. And I don't mean that in a kind of uh, you know, pejorative, anti-Christian, anti-religious way. I'm just saying that a thousand years ago, Christianity washed up on the shores of Scandinavia and, and slowly through proselytizing and, uh, and conversion, the Norse became Christianized. The tipping point, the point of divergence in my alternate timeline is that never happened. And so the space gods that you talked about are a kind of uh, inhabit a pagan present or a pagan near future. There's a science fiction element, but it's it comes from the, the, the road less traveled, taking the path towards paganism as opposed to Christianity. Um, and so in the beginning is, the, is obviously the, the, the genesis of the Bible. It's, the, it's that you know, when God sat down and, and made the earth out of, out of nothing, that there'd be light, all of that kind of stuff. But in Norse mythology, it's Odin, the Allfather, who fashions the world, who fashions the newer Heimar, the nine home worlds, from the blood and brains of Ymir, the, the titanic, um, you know, kind of primeval god. Um, and so the story of the Viking verse is really this. It's Odin, who knows that he's going to get swallowed by the wolf, you can see him on the on the cover there, gets swallowed by Fenrir. It's inevitable. The title comes from actually you know, one of Odin's own phrases. He knows that he's going to be swallowed by the wolf. So he assembles all of the great and the good, the mighty and the powerful throughout history to fight this last battle. But he says, he says, even then we've got all of these people, but they will seem too few when the wolf comes. So he knows he's facing this inevitable demise. If you were facing your inevitable demise, perhaps you might uh, tinker with the timelines. You might try and find a bolt hole, an escape hatch. Um, and that's really what the Viking verse is all about. Odin, in order to uh, avert catastrophe, he... Uh, changes the timelines he tampers with history he throws history to the wolves and in doing so uh, we create this divergent path where history as we know it changes and this pagan present comes about and that kind of in the beginning phrase you know all of that uh, that kind of uh, the latin language the mother church all of that is eroded from history Hmm. So just to be clear to our viewers, uh, When the Wolf Comes is about a, I would say about 360 page role playing book. Um, I think it's even, I think it's even longer. I think it's even longer. I think it's nearly 400 pages. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's been and, a while and, since, uh, it's been, been a while since I've skimmed through to the back. 392. Mm. And, Hefty and, tome. And this book is all you need. It's not like a, 
like D and D with the uh, Dungeons and Dragons with Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, or Monster Manual. This is everything you need in this with, to play this game with this book. Am I correct about that? That is what? correct. That is correct. We put it all into that uh, 392 page monstrosity, um, <laughs> and it's 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 built on the Shadow of the Demon Lord rules by a guy called uh, Rob Schraub, who's been an industry alumni for for many many years. Been involved in Warhammer and D and D and creating all kinds of rule sets, um, and so that framework that his rules for Shadow of the Demon Lord just suited the Viking verse and the story that I was telling there so well, um, it does enable you to get all of that Viking goodness and, and, and present it all in one go without you know several different books. So you could have easily done a book about um, Norse mythology and, and role-playing in, a, in, in, a, in the ancient world. Um, instead, you created a science fiction book Using Norse mythology as, as a as, as the backdrop and setting and so forth. If I may ask, what what made you decide to go science fiction with this? Well, I don't know if you play any video games, any games like Civilization or Crusader Kings, or if you just stick in with the the, the TTRPGs. But the if you play those kind of epic uh, strategy games. The grand world building games that you know that, that they represent they tell this sweep of civilization from you know 4000 bc or whatever in the case of civ all the way through to launching to uh, the rocket to alpha centauri right so i think i had a misspent youth playing every version of civilization from two upwards and perhaps that got stuck in me when i began to write the novels uh because the the all father paradox the novel that starts all of this and the the sequel loki's wager really do start telling that timeline that i talked about that alternate timeline from the tipping point of charlemagne's empire from the point where it's about 792 and uh it's it's the age of Lindisfarne. It's the age of Ragnar, if you know the uh, the, the TV shows. Um, and things start there, but as the timelines diverge, we want to get towards this pagan prison. I create these um, kind of mini stories, these these uh, retellings of episodes in history, like the Mongol siege of Kiev. Um, you know, back in 1220-ish, 1240, um, through to you know the the, uh, the reimagined pagan present where they are in this kind of sci-fi style setting. Um, through to I mean, there's a there's a comic back there as well, the Jotun War, which is a kind of retelling of a, a pastiche of World War Two but set on Jotunheim and where the, the, the Viking empire that has emerged faces off against the Norse nightmares, the Jotnar, the devourers of Norse myth. And I'll just grab it here for you can see the, the kind of parody cover there is the, the flag of you know, uh, Iwo Jima, the, you know, that, that, that classic um, symbol of World War II, but reimagined with the Raven banner on Jotunheim. Um, so, that's a long way of saying that I'm using all of these vignettes, all of these little mini stories to tell this sweep of civilization because the story and the setting is so much more than just Vikings. It's the what if. It's the what if Vikings ruled the sea and stars. It's what would have happened with the Apollo moon landing. It's what would have happened in World War II. It's what would, um, you know, Albert Einstein, what would he have developed instead of E, M, C, e equal MC squared, the theory of relativity? Perhaps it's recast in runes, right? E equal MC squared in runes, or uh, you know, the, the, the theories of survival of the fittest by Charles Darwin, uh, all of those kind of things. His name would have been Carl Divan, if you old Norseify it. We try and do all of that kind of thing, but look at everything through a Norse lens. And then you can tell these compelling stories and create an environment where players can inhabit that realm authentically 
and using that north lens kind of peer into what the world might be like you mentioned a few times that um these are a lot of this is based on some stories you've written when i heard the term viking verse i assumed that this will be a first set of role-playing books that will be related to maybe other settings and so forth. But I'm thinking now what you what what it means is more like these are based on books that you've read. So did this did the the books come first before the idea of the role-playing game? Exactly, exactly. So 2018, the All Father Paradox was published. The Loki's Wager was published just um, shortly before covid the jotun war and there's an, also an old norse phrase book as well old norse for modern times in which in case you need to say things like these are not the droids we're looking for in old norse then it's all there um so <clears throat> the those kind of things were my playground uh beforehand and then during covid like so many people we were cut off and needed a you know a, a hobby and i came back to role-playing games that i hadn't played for many years um you know since i was a a younger man um you know kids and day jobs and all of that kind of stuff had got in, in the way but the covid form created a new kind of uh lease of life in that we instead of getting around a table we were online it great gave people a way to connect gave people a way to tell toys tell stories gave people a way to uh, deal with the horror of that time. You know, it seems a, a, a dim and receding memory now, but um, the good thing that came out of it was everyone said, well, you know, you've written these books. We're having such a great time, you know, role-playing with D&D and other games. Why don't you turn your unique setting into uh, something we can play? So that's exactly what uh, what I did. And so got in touch with... Uh, Rob Schwab and um, <clears throat> harnessed his Shadow of the Demon Lord rules to bring the setting to life. Mm. I, I want to talk more about your setting um, very soon, but you mentioned Powered by Shadow of the Demon Lord. Now, you could uh, you could have easily made your setting into a, a Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition uh, a variation of yep. sorts. Um, there's a lot of those, though, aren't there? They're kind yes. of there's a glut. <laughs> so, if I may ask, why? I mean, and there's also a lot of great um, alternative systems out there, alternative rule systems. Why did you pick Powered by uh, Shadow of the Demon Lord as as your system? Um, for very many reasons, but thematically, it really does fit. That's number one. So the the universe of Shadow of the Demon Lord is uh, this eldritch, impossible foe who's tearing through reality. The shadow of this Demon Lord casts itself on Earth and uh, with a U. And your band of heroes is facing their inevitable doom against you. This, this, this just evil cataclysm now there's a there's a darkness and a despair to that game um now when the wolf comes isn't exactly thematically like it but there are parallels with ragnarok the twilight of the gods that is the centerpiece of norse myth that i was talking about whether the wolf eats fenrir there's an inevitability there's a there's a doom laden quality to it and the norse uh like good vikings would just you know, it was like uh, like Worf in Star Trek. Today is a good day to die, right? It's like you 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 faced your future without without fear or without complaint. If today was your day to die, if the Norns were said that this was your demise, so be it. Go down fighting, right? So there's parallels between Shadow of the Demon Lord and its uh, its doom laden qualities and and Ragnarok that. I really did like so that was one number two would be the 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 path system so playing D D as we all have <clears throat> I found it very kind of a bit like a straight jacket right the, and and not very elegant you were stuck with your classes and it really didn't help you evolve a story or a saga and 
Bear in mind that a lot of the Norse myth that we're talking about here is based upon these epic Icelandic sagas that are at the root of modern day fantasy. Tolkien stole so much from that that then it inspired Gygax, etc., etc. Um, so we've got all of this Norse mythology at the root of this hobby that we're all involved with. Um, and we've got these sagas that span generations at the heart of the, this, this setting. So um, that storytelling element that is very much part of Shadow of the Demon Lord and the ability to start a novice path and take your first steps and then to effectively what in D&D would be multi-classing, taking different paths of, of you know, there's <clears throat> dozens of expert paths and then on top of that is mythic paths or in Rob's original rules, master paths. And you end up with some very unique characters that uh, can, in the kind of... Uh, old verbiage you know be part bard part fighter part mage you know or or just you know flow through to the 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 kind of core of that fighter path but take on different permutations different guises and so i loved that about the rule set it's also to you know the third point i'd say is it's very elegant simple clean easy to pick up easy to to introduce new people to um you know, it's a, a, a D20 game with, you know, this concept of boons and banes, which are, which alter the, the, that core D20 role, but it's very simple. Um, and that's a part of the storytelling element as well. It gives the GM the ability to just get to the fun part, right? That's the essence of these games. It should be telling a story and having fun. The rules should guide you but not get in the way of it. So there's mechanics and there's cool mechanics and there's fun things, but it's there to enable you, not to hinder you. So let's talk a little bit about the setting. It's in the future. It looks like Ragnarok is coming. You actually have a great uh, little um, blurb in here where Odin is saying that, like, he can't believe that he's going to look at Ragnarok through a TV screen, you know? And I yeah. thought that was such a wonderful image yep. uh, to capture. So it looks like uh, the Ragnarok is coming. The, the gods are trying to stop it, and you're sort of in the middle where whether you can you can help them or this is your chance to take control uh, yourself or get, grab some riches out of it, take advantage of the situation. Um, uh, am I close to understanding? Yeah, I, I I think you I think you've kind of got the gist of it. The there's that famous uh, Einstein phrase, just to mention him again, where he says. Uh, uh, God does not play dice with the universe, right? I like the the, the twist on that to say no, they, they do. They the gods the gods do play dice with the universe, and you know they they kind of mess things up. The essence with Norse gods is that they were kind of just as fallible and uh, <clears throat> ridiculous as the humans that worship them. They're not omniscient, all powerful. They you know without uh, idols, apples. Um, the the kind of the gift of immortality. Then they they wither in age just like everybody else. Um, they're full of vanity and hubris and rage and pride and uh, and so they've created this world that's exactly the same, right? Um, that's the setting. And and if they're to be found, um, you know, they're 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 not uh, you know just down the end of the road. They are. Um, you know, kind of recalcitrant gods. They are missing gods. And the wolf itself isn't really a literal, you know, wolf devouring the, the, the heavens and it's, it's huge gaping more snapping up the sun. It's more the concept that, you know, the Nietzschean concept, the man is wolf to man, right? So man has created these gods in his image. Um, man aspires to adopt the mantle of those gods and you know man has invented ways to try and seek immortality and again some of this is a pastiche of the things we see in our society today where people are injecting themselves with uh, the blood of young people or people are using nanites to to keep themselves alive or or looking at freezing themselves to, to so they can exist in a far-flung future people will do anything they can to try and survive and, and thwart death and that's a 
similar to what I've said that Odin tries to do, right? So as as technology evolves and you've got these Vikings who aspire to be the gods, um, they want to create Iden's apples for themselves. They want the gift of immortality. Once they've got that, does that make them gods? Does that make the player characters gods? When they've got that power, what do they do with it? Um, probably nothing good. So the, 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 the setting... We talk about Ragnarok being on the horizon. The thing is with Ragnarok in Norse mythology, it was a kind of cyclical thing as well. It never really went away. And I like the idea. I like the fact that there is, there is seldom a single doom, right? It comes in waves. You can't avoid it. The Norns, who are the kind of fates of, uh, of, the, of the mythos, you know, they, 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 weave the tapestry of time and fate behind the scenes they're pissed off if you change your fate and so they do whatever they can to bring you back into line and and make sure you meet your maker at the appointed time so if people are tampering the timelines and trying to play god the norns are always there to whip you back into shape and and make you obey your you know the the, the fates so that that pervasive doom that reoccurrent doom that you think you've got away with it but you probably haven't those are some of the kind of themes and motifs and they apply to both the players and the gods themselves and are the gods um how closely do they associate themselves with uh humanity in this game is it more like the mighty thor like in the comic books or is it more like a god of war or is it much more hands off yeah much more hands off and that goes through to religion as well because when you're designing a game um that takes norse myth as its as its core and you know, involves that kind of tussle with christianity that i've mentioned is you know when we're, we're not creating a, a a system where there's fireballs and lightning bolts we're using the traditional norse crafts of seether of Gand, of Galda, of the, the kind of things that were at the root of uh, Tolkien's idea of magic and then fancy magic and everything evolves from that, right? But, you know, a thousand, you know, 1500 years ago, those were the names that they gave to spellcraft, to witchcraft. It was, it was Sather and Gand and Galda. Um, when you create that as your magic system, and you try and think, well, how do I put some kind of Christian stuff in there? How do I put Christianity in there? The essence of Christianity is that all of that stuff is witchcraft. There are no spells if you're Christian. That's demonology. That's, you know, there's, you might have a touch of white magic, but that's effectively medicine or science. One of the things that I talk about in the book, and again, it's a, it's a kind of pastiche of Arthur C. Clarke and his, his, uh, law about technology right any um <clears throat> any sufficiently advanced science seems like magic um so i twist that around and say any sufficiently advanced technology seems like galda right because it's the they're the same kind of thing technology and magic have always been the same thing a, a viking seeress a vulva would have hoodwinked people into thinking that she's casting magic. Anyway, this is a long way around of answering your question about the gods. Are the gods prevalent? Are the gods present? Um, you, the Christian god isn't present. The Christian magic isn't present. And whilst the Norse gods are out there, the Vikings of the Norse worship their pantheon in a very different way. And I wanted to get that across as well as get the authentic magic system. Because... When in D and D you say, oh, "I am a, I'm a priest of Thor," it just never happened. It just wasn't a thing. You might be a full truey of Thor. You might be you know, uh, someone who was faithful to Thor, but you represented the pantheon. Um, you worshipped the pantheon in a way that you called upon them when you needed them. They were all there, and you know, I mean, I've got a charm here, the you know, Thor's hammer. You know, I'm going to pray to Thor for that. But you know, I need a good harvest, so. You know, I'm going to pray to Sif. Uh, you know, I, I need uh, I need some luck on my journey across the sea. So that's going to be Njord. And so you you're gonna you're gonna you're not worshiping one god, even if you are a cleric, um, a godsman, a gothy, would have 
availed themselves of all of the gods at any given time, given to, uh, depending on which one was most opportune or most uh, uh, likely to impact the situation. And so that's something that I wanted to get across as well. There's no one true god. There's a group of gods and just as important, spirits the ancestors the land is alive the norse believed that everything was teeming with consciousness whether it was the barrow mound where your ancestors was was it whether it was the spirit of the trees the spirit of the rocks and incidentally that's then what leads us to the notion of alpha and diverga which become the elves and dwarves they are literally in norse myth the embodiment of the land around us, this land of Atir, land spirits. And from that, Tolkien took pointy-eared forest dwellers and gruff-bearded dudes um, with, with, with axes, and D&D &D, you know, extrapolated and kept those. But if you strip it right back down to that core setting, then it's you know, the, the gods are on the same level as the Alpha as the Diverga. They're all very similar beings. Um, they're not elevated dudes with white beards in the clouds. They much more walk among us or are intrinsically part of the landscape. Hmm. And if, if I may ask, especially in case any viewers are curious about what human civilization is like in this game in the future, it sounds like um, spirituality is still a great part of of the future, um, and I see from looking at the book that there's you know there's 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 robots um, uh, or at least mechanical beings. Um, uh, so what what is like I I, I um, is it this this book doesn't give you like oh this is Vikings in the future it's not thing that simplistic. Uh, this is a very complicated um, uh, story. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, well, let's take the, the robots as an example because I think it will help elucidate uh, where, where I kind of originated all of these things from. So in Norse myth, the Dverg, the dwarves as we call them, uh, were, were they, they had life breathed into them by the gods. But they were originally these maggot-like creatures that feasted on the, the bones and blood of this primeval giant right and then gods breathed life into them um they were creatures of rock the bones and the blood then be uh, became the earth itself right midgard so i like that idea that motif um and i didn't want to create the kind of fantasy archetype dwarves who are short and stunty and you know and bad tempered miners because the original Dverga that on that they're modeled on were never short. They were never described as short at all. That's a product of Christianization. Christianization, Christianization marginalized all of these things and shrunk them. They made trolls live under bridges and they made dwarves, you know, live in mines or fairies at the end of the garden. The original creatures in myth were you know, these powerful spiritual figures uh, who were, you know, the, the earth incarnate. So, um, cast yourself into the future and, uh, you know, mankind is clearly on a similar trajectory and wants to create automatons, want to create servants, especially after the Jotun War, which is, like I mentioned, is a, a world-spanning version of World War Two. you know, decimates the population. Um Similar to our World War One and World War Two, you want to build mechanized troops. You want to build tanks, armor, and use that to protect people, as opposed to cavalry charges into machine guns. Right? We learn a lot from war. War is the mother of all invention. And if you're a warlike culture like the Norse, and war is in your bones, then you're going to develop these things a lot faster. Arguably, that's the premise. Anyway, so the Diverga are. Um, brought out of myth as versions of our tanks, our armor. They are 
uh, infused with the spirits, this consciousness that I've talked about, because it's everywhere. The consciousness, people believe in these ancestral spirits in the consciousness of the land. They fuse them into the, the soil and rock and the polymers and the various you know, chemical elements that, that uh, make up the periodic table, um, the metals, the, the, um, the compounds, and they make the Virga. Uh, and so they're kind of robots in a sense, but they're also very true to that ancestral myth. These are creatures of soil and rock and metal. They're born still from Ymir's bones, just like they are a myth. They're infused with consciousness, but they are servitors. They are thralls, uh, the, using the old uh, Norse word for a slave. They're effectively uh, designed to be minesweepers or sewage cleaners or gun emplacements and they're given truncated life spans uh, again that's a bit of a pun both on the short stature that dwarves normally get but also a kind of element of blade runner and you know the the five year uh, lifespan of the replicants so they're given crappy battery lives they're given five year lifespans they're made to use all of the do all of the menial tasks and because of that um, they retain some of that grumpy, dour, miserableness that comes with traditional dwarves because if you've got a five-year lifespan and you're asked to clean up all of humanity's doo-doo, then you're going to be a bit grumpy. So, so that is a good example of how I take an origin or a race um, and take that mythological bent and then cast it into the future. So it's recognizable. Um, but it's something a bit more unique. It's not just a robot. It's not just a dwarf. It's a kind of combination of the two of them with that essence of Norse mythology running all the way through it. Does that all make sense? Oh, yes, yes. And and to tie into that a little bit, um, who can you be? What what choices can you be, can players be in this in this day? I, I, I did take a look at some of those options, and um, I... I I am impressed with the variety of, of things you can you can be. Uh, yes, I think uh, there are ten ten to begin with. And again, I'm gonna just take a D and D trope and what I did with it. So, you know, half elves, right? In North North mythology, in Norse mythology, I should really be able to say that these days since I say it so often. Um, there are half elves, right? There's a, there's a, a half elven sorceress called Skuld. There are some uh, Wagnerian characters who are uh, like Ulbrich, who are half dwarf. And again, in Norse myth, elves and dwarves, not too much difference between them. That's a later thing that where Tolkien separated them out. Um, sometimes they use it interchangeably. Certainly, Doc Alpha, dark elves and dwarves are used inter interchangeably. And because what we're talking about here is something that's you know a thousand years old or eight hundred years old and was was written down. You know, 200 years after the oral tradition, it's not neatly defined in the way that you need it to be for a role-playing game, right? So there's a, a large amount of leaps of faith and imagination that you have to do to take these terms and these ideas and make them something that's playable. So going back to this half-elf notion, half-elf is uh, you know, half-human, half-elf. Um, but what about a half-dwarf? What about a half giant? You know, some of these things kind of exist. So I took these core Eddic races, and the Eddas are the kind of Snorri Sturluson stuff, where which really lay out these maths, uh, lay out these races. And you've got the Jotnar, the the, the giants we'd call them. Um, although Gion is a French word, and so the original Jotnar really does mean devourer. It's a very primeval creature it's the oncoming storm it's uh, it's fire giants it's the elements it's the ice it's the raging you know tempest of nature that's really what these yotna are and then you do have the diverga that i've talked about and you have the alpha again these kind of ancestral spirits of the dead um you know so i take those and the, and obviously the archetypal man. So then you got so you got four original races, and then I want to create hybrid races from all of them with this sci-fi bent. So for example, in Norse myth you have these uh, the, the sons of Avaldi. The sons of Avaldi are 
these enigmatic figures who forged the weapons that Odin takes the, the his spear Gungnir, for example. They're these dwarf smiths, perhaps, but they're these uncanny artificers. And so I take the notion that a half human, half dwarf hybrid would be something like these sons of, of Avaldi. And they're um, a kind of clone race um, who are um, you know, part cyborg. You know, they've infused themselves with with uh, mechanics and and circuitry in order to get a long life and they are arms traders and arms dealers in the same way as that they you know f originally in myth forged the weapons for the gods now they forged some of the uh, the more potent say nuclear devices in this setting so that's a half human half dwarf um there are the you know it, it, as you look through the book, there are the the Jotna, there are the Jan Vidna, the Jan Vidna are the, are the children of the Ironwood, again drawn from Norse myth, and what they are is effectively uh, sentient animals, uplifted animals. So you see these wolfish figures within the books. They are child soldiers bred for war in the, the, the horrific Jotun War, the Ragnarok uh, events. And so you've got these wolfish, kind of werewolf soldiers, but they're they're uplifted creatures, um, <clears throat> and plenty more besides. They all have their roots in Norse mythology. They all have the nomenclature in Norse mythology, um, and that's something I try and do throughout. Is every spell, every path, every item has its old Norse name. Not that you necessarily want to. You know, wrestle with Old Norse when you're at the gaming table. But I just think it adds to the bit of authenticity, right? To understand that this really was called that a thousand years ago or an approximation of it. And so it adds to the legitimacy of these things. The sons of Ivaldi, you know, are the uh, <clears throat> Ivaldi Sinir in Old Norse, for example. So anyway, I hope that gives you a flavor. There are 10 origins that leads into four novice paths, which leads into, you know, umpteen expert paths because i've released various different supplements over the over the year uh since the game itself came out in pdf um so there's lots to play with mm. and then i appreciate that you uh created uh, unique names um for for these uh um uh, options that players can be uh i, I honestly i think if, if they were called like fighter mage cleric that type of thing, it probably, I probably would have, I, I would have lost immersion in what you're creating here. Uh, so I like that a lot. I and and I, that's that's exactly what I was going for. So I'm glad you said that because I think it's important not to call an explorer an explorer when you can call it a widefarer, right? There's this famous saga of uh, Ingvar the widefarer who was a Norseman who found himself, you know, in the Black Sea and beyond in in 1040. And so he's Ingvar the Far Traveled, or Ingvar the Widefarer. And if you're creating an explorer class, call it that. If you're creating a uh, a Paladin class, call it a Varangian, because that's more authentic. They were Paladins were originally the palace guards of the Franks, the palace guards of the <clears throat> uh, Byzantine Empire in Miklagard, or what. Well, was called Constantinople, but called by the Vikings Miklagard, the great city, were the Varangians. So there, there are words for all of these things. I spent way too long finding the best and most authentic <clears throat> way to, you know, to codify to 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 put that down. Sometimes it doesn't quite work. There's just no, you know, um, no real. Uh, modern equivalent but the language of the norse is so poetic there's a reason they had scouts there's a reason why they have kennings and all of this great poetry they've got the perfect words for it so often why would you use a kind of anemic latin or french inspired version when you can use the the granddaddy of them all hmm. who are the antagonists in this in this uh, game yeah, that's a good question. So, <laughs> I think you know one of the 
one of the ways in which I try to set it up is there's no good guys, there's shades of grey, right? So if you were looking at the comic books, the Viking, the, the Jotun War series, you'd assume that this great Norse empire that spans worlds were the good guys fighting the bad guys. It's like, uh, you know, allies versus Nazis. Um, but in the RPG, I didn't necessarily want that to be the case. Um, because a Viking empire that spans worlds that has conquered everything probably isn't very nice, right? I mean, the, the, the British empire, the American empire, they do, you know, the, the stuff the CIA get up to, you know, the good guys use some dubious tactics sometimes. Um, and by the same token, you know, the Jotnar have been defeated in this war and they're now rolled into internment camps. They're made into slaves. They, uh, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're booted off their land. There's a, there's a, an almost, uh, you know, Afghanistan or, or Iraq feel to Jotunheim. And so, you know, they're persecuted. Do you want to play as a band of uh, avenging Jotna? That's yeah, that's fine. Do you want to play as uh, <clears throat> as Viking raiders and pillagers? That's fine. So your your question is, who's the antagonist? It depends where you are. There's nine homeworlds from Norse myth that creates effectively nine factions. None of them are particularly good. Um, each of them have got their own agendas. Uh, so you, you, how you play is up to you and what agenda you pursue. Um, whether you try and end the, uh, the cycle of Ragnarok and, uh, or, 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 or adopt the mantle of the gods yourself and supplant them by becoming you know, all-powerful um, and using all of these other origins and races as stepping stones in your path to, uh, yeah, to taking over the universe. Correct me if I'm wrong. But it appears that this feels um, you don't lean heavily on like aliens. Like that's not you know humans versus aliens type of thing. In fact, it feels I feel I believe there's no aliens at all. It has a a firefly feel to it, where it's just humanity de dealing with humanity. Unless you consider, of course, the gods aliens. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I consider the gods just you know effectively uh, long lived <clears throat> humans who have you know wised up or genetically implanted themselves or technologically implanted themselves with something or other, right? Um, and even the Yotna are <clears throat> born of rebellion. So I'll just explain that a little bit uh, because they're, they're quintessentially human. The Norse worshipped animals in a way that we've kind of lost touch with. You know, there's a reason that eagles and wolves and bears uh, are very much part of their mythos. Um, people would be proud and say that they were sired by a polar bear, that they had wolves in their lineage. The, the, there are, the ancient um, tribes were called the Hundings and the Woofings and stuff like that. Right? Go, all of this is sort of in Beowulf and other texts. So when you get into the future, it does make sense that these people who wanted to emulate animals who've got the ability to genetically splice themselves with animals, literally become part animals. So the Ulfhedna, the wolf warriors of, of <clears throat> the Viking past, the berserkers, the bear shirts, are infused with animal DNA so that they have uh, superhuman speed and eyesight and power and that's really what the Jotnar are <clears throat> they might come across as monstrous some of them are failed experiments some of them are kind of the two-headed etin some of them are you know these 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 huge fire giants of Norse myth but ultimately they are human experiments and experiments done by the equivalent of Loki the equivalent of Loki who's the trickster god who uses this thrall uprising, this slave rebellion, this emancipation of the serfs, again, things that happen in real world history, and just layer on that Norse myth, layer on that, um, that kind of trickster cutting to 
create a slave uprising you know, of Jotna, of Norse nightmares against the Norse Empire. So, you know, it's again, it's a, <clears throat> it's a kind of tale of a parallel to the kind of dissolution of the British Empire or any other empire in history, but told through that Norse lens. So, all of there are no aliens there are just permutations of man and his machines and his mistakes and how he has to handle them the repercussions of that which is in itself a ragnarok of its own right just like the gods kind of create ragnarok you shouldn't forget that fenrir is actually a child of uh loki um and he probably wouldn't have been so pissed off if the gods hadn't tricked him via tear sticking his hand in his mouth and using dwarven chains to cage him for all eternity, or at least until he snaps his bonds and escapes. If they'd have raised him like a nice wolf pup and trained him, perhaps Fenrir would have been, you know, a, a, a pleasant little Labrador. Or, the, you know, not a Labrador, but you know what I mean. Having the disposition of a Labrador. The point is that they tormented Fenrir and they paid the price. And I just like that motif all the way through. Your mistakes come back to haunt you, and the gods make more mistakes than most. When I talk to other creators about equipment and items, and especially in science fiction games, yep. um, I, I've noticed some of the answers they, that, that I receive from them is that they have a, it's pretty much the hardest section for them to do, because that's really the section where you kind of detail out how does their society function in some way. So, for example, if they're eating, are they using a fork, a knife, or are they using chopsticks, um, things of that nature. So, when it comes to the science fiction, especially, you know, think about like what type of weapons, um, what kind of armor, and uh, those details can be pretty tricky. Uh, did you come across any of those difficulties as well? Yes, because, again, it's a kind of low magic setting, right, with the things that I talked about, the Seder, the, 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 the Gand, um, and there's, uh, you know, you need to kind of modernize those a little bit. So Seda involves hallucinogens and drugs. Um, Gand involves, you know, messing around with atmospherics and vacuum to create the same kind of weather effects. Um, so there's some sleight of hand in order to, to get to where you need to be with the, what I call bound objects, which are magic objects. The thing is, the Norse were always um, very highly attuned to things like their swords. The sword was an extension of themselves. And so the notion that a weaponsmith created something you know, almost genetically encoded to you isn't too far from the truth. You know, this sword was an extension of your arm and the craftsmanship was an extension of your honor and, in and integrity. So I play around with that as well. And then the notion of artifacts. One of the, you know, I talked about the all father paradox and the two, the, 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 the timelines and how Odin had broken them. Do you know that the, the grandfather paradox is a, is a temporal paradox where you go back in time, you kill your grandfather and therefore you can't be born and so you can't go back in time and kill your grandfather. So I play around with that, call it the all-father paradox, because Odin is the all-father, right? So if the all-father goes back in time and messes with things, it's the all-father paradox. But what he does is he creates this separate timeline. You've got the Christian timeline, the one that we live in, our world, and then you've got the Norse timeline, the Viking verse, and they sit alongside each other, a bit like twisting coils of the DNA helix. Um, it's possible to go between the two, uh, there are fractures between those realities, so sometimes angels leak through, leak through to the Viking verse. In the Viking terms, they'd go, oh, it must be a Valkyrie or something, right? Because they don't have the language. Or if, if they call it, a, a, they might call it an Engil, which is the Old Norse for angel. Yeah, but there's, they don't quite have the same way to interpret it. But these fractures between the timelines let things leak through. Um, so when I create artifacts, for example, they're things that are pretty much fallen through the timelines. There is one um, artifact in the in the book, which is effectively uh, an iPhone. 
you might not in the Viking verse it doesn't exist as an iPhone. You know, you you don't know what it is. It's a it's a cylinder of black metal that appears to give you. It's called the prophetic wand, right? Because it gives you the insights. But it's a very rare thing that's fallen through the timelines. Same as the Lindisfarne Gospels, a book that shouldn't exist that was burnt, you know, in the uh, in the Viking verse remains in our universe it's in the british library or something falls through the timelines and they have this ornate bejeweled tome from centuries ago and it comes with christian powers that shouldn't apply to this world so that's how i've played around with uh magic items and one of the quotes from the original when once someone reviewed one of the original books and this might help distill it for you and and viewers is it's American Gods meets Doctor Who, right? That's the that's the best way to kind of describe this because there are temporal paradoxes. There are messed up things um, that shouldn't be because Odin has tinkered with the timelines. You know, chaos in shoes. Let's talk a little bit about the, the art direction for this book. Were you, were you concerned about any... Uh, uh, any direction an artist may take? Was there a certain vision you wanted to be sure that this book had, design-wise? Yeah, so um, there are three three artists involved, and they all predate my working with Shroud Entertainment, Rob Shroud, and, and uh, publishing uh, the RPG. So <clears throat> there were some artists, like uh, Dev Pramanak, um, Gare Curti, uh, who were all involved in creating the comics, um, Jeremy Moller, who created the artwork for the front of When the Wolf Comes and the front of the books, the novels. And so that was already in existence, that style. And we decided to take that Kirby-esque, that comic book style that exists in the comic books and in the novels, and bring it to the RPG as a way to differentiate it. Um, because... You know, it's there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of I don't know historical painting stuff that exists for the Vikings already. So that Kirby s feeling was a way to make it larger than life, to mm -hmm. take that kind of marvel of the 70s and 80s feel with Odin on Asgard, and just play with that a little bit. It wasn't uh, you know we're, we're I hope you can tell from this we haven't made a, a comic book style uh, RPG. It's not all about superpowers. It's very authentic. But there was something about that art style that enabled you to easily understand what a pagan present or a near sci-fi future would feel like. Um, because it's very hard to, you know, if you're trying to articulate, well, I need a, I need a space Viking. Can you draw me that? Mm. You know, very difficult to do. You know, last thing you want is someone to come back with a bubble helmet and horns on it. Uh, Game Master Tools. Um, is there anything in here that helps Game Masters um, uh, try to create the setting as, as a, uh, I don't know, if the term realistic as possible for players, but yeah, enough for them so that they can be immersed into this world. Yeah. You know, I try and list a whole bunch of media inspirations. So everything from those kind of Nordic noir thrillers, the Scandi noir thrillers that you get uh, on Netflix or on, you know, as whatever streaming uh, stuff you have, those kind of a gritty murder in a, in an icy forest, you know, those kind of things are good inspiration, but there's, uh, you know, innumerable um, Viking TV shows and films that you can watch. I will often refer to it as the Northman in space as well. Right, It's a, it's a great uh, recent film that's worth checking out. So the media inspirations are, are one thing. I list a whole bunch of books and sagas and edders that people should perhaps dip into to inspire them. Um, but then in terms of Game Master's tools, again, the Shadow of the Demon Lord rule set, you know, has got some very elegant, simple framing for all of this stuff about how to tell stories, about how to use rules in the service of those stories. And so all of that is there as, as well. You know, there's a whole chapter on that stuff. And I think that um, 
it does a good job rather than throw people in at the deep end. It gives them that that life support system. It gives them a, a something to hold on to to tell the stories. And then the store, the the book itself does include a starter adventure for people to you know experiment. It's got some classic Viking things in it. I won't spoil it too much, but it, it there's a there's a few kind of again vignettes or or chapters that really should explain how to take the kind of viking of the past and bring it up to the modern day bear in mind that because we're in this midgard that has been shattered by uh, a form of ragnarok um it kind of is the wild wild west or the wild wild north um <laughs> because you know there's the there isn't a centralized police force. There isn't a properly functioning uh, government because Midgard has fallen. The world has gone to rack and ruin. There's been continuous wars. Um, you know, it just it, it sets it all up nicely um, for all of your player characters to go to hell, obviously with one L, because hell with two Ls is a Christian invention. Mm. So, um, if I may ask, what is it about Norse mythology that has captured pop culture and modern culture uh, um, uh, uh, strongly still to this day? Um, it, it's not like, a, like Greek mythology I can understand because a lot of Greek uh, ideas and philosophy is, is still, it, it's still around to this day. Uh, but Norse mythology is interesting, where it's 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 a lot of different thought and philosophy, especially in contrast to Greek. Um, but it, it, we, you know, we, we still get video games, we still have uh, um, comic books, movies, still based on um, culture and mythology of, of this of this time. Uh, why do you think that is? I think there's a few answers to that. I mean, the simplest is it's perhaps it's the original and the best. Um, not to take anything away from the the Greek and Romans, but you know the uh, the Norse myths are kind of more I don't know integral to our way of thinking. There's something that goes to our core about them, and that perhaps it's because um, you know a, a lot of America, a lot of England, a lot of Europe was conquered by these guys and, you know, Anglo-Saxons have gone everywhere and they've taken with them these stories that are in their bones. They've taken with them their kind of enterprise, their love of language. I mean, Shakespeare wouldn't perhaps exist if he didn't have the rich tapestry of this, this, this language that was part Old Norse, part French, all slammed together um he you know hamlet itself is a norse story amleth was the original prince right you got all of these cultural touch points that just are in our bones and in our work ethic and in our need to explore and be in, in, and and innovate the norse uh, weren't just this bloodthirsty barbarian culture they invented these magnificent ships that could travel the world. They invented, um, you know, these these rich poems. They invented, I don't know. So there's so much the honor culture, the the you know the the spirit of doing what your community needed you to do. All of that kind of stuff. It's just I I I think it's just intrinsic in a way that Greek and Roman stuff isn't we can touch the Norse stuff almost because our forebears were part of it and i'm not talking blood and soil nazi stuff you know i'm not going there but i am saying that there's uh there's a f the word folk you know that folksiness that folk moot that you know that that it, it's part of the people you know all of that stuff is is it's much closer to us whereas the greeks and romans being you know, a, a thousand years more distant just seem a bit weirder, a bit more alien. And, and if I may ask, and you don't have to answer this, um, it, uh, being that obviously you're a huge fan of and have a good, a great understanding of, of Norse mythology, 
um, and the cultures uh, of that time. Is there anything about the modern era that you feel that sort of annoys you that they keep getting wrong about Norse mythology? Oh yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, let's let's do it. We need another hour. Um, everything from the horned helmets to the bloodthirsty barbarians to the the notion that this wasn't a an amazingly bright civilization in itself. Um, one of the very first proponents of counterfactual history, alternative history, is this is this guy called uh, Arnold Toynbee, um, and he is one of those historians that wrote those huge tomes that you might have seen at university, the you know, the study of history, mm-hmm. volume one, two, seventeen, right? Just but he wrote an appendix called the Forfeited Birthright of the Abortive Scandinavian Civilization, where he pointed out, and this is one of the things that inspired me that. They came so close to conquering Constantinople. They, they, they laid siege to Paris twice. They owned London for a time. Um, all of this stuff we're talking about in the novels isn't that far beyond the realm of possibility. If they hadn't just taken the Danegelt, the silver, and vanished, um, they really could have been this Scandinavian civilization that, that, that was the precursor to... You know, the British or American civilizations. Um, and I think that people lose sight of that. I think people think, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, there's Ragnar Lothbrok. He's jumped in a, in a long ship and he's murdered some monks. And that's the extent of what they want to recognize about Vikings. But uh, there's such a rich culture. Um, runes is another one that bugs me because you know they did have an alphabet called the Fufark. They did have runes. It evolved over time. There are various different forms of it, from Gothic to you know the the the, the Norse stuff. It was all based probably on when the the first marauders came out in the fifth century. They probably looked at the the Roman alphabet and borrowed from it, or the Greek alphabet and fused bits from it. But then for people to sit round and uh, you know, cast the runes and come up with uh, you know, meanings for the runes that don't really exist, in a, that, that bugs me a little bit. Um, and more so when people get their tattoos of things they think are runes or, or, but are actually Icelandic sigils from the 18th century. Yeah, several, you know, 400, 500, 600 years after the Viking Age, they're not Viking tattoos, they're Icelandic sigils, and they're a mishmash of all of that kind of heathenness, that Gnosticism, that uh, that um, kind of spiritualism that all came together as people tried to work out how these ancient things get, you know, inspired each other. It's just all a mishmash and a fusion. It's not legitimately authentic now. I do use some of that in the Viking verse, to be fair, but that's because my civilization has evolved and would do the same mishmash of things. But just don't get it tattooed on yourself and say it's a Viking symbol because it, it isn't. <laughs> is there is there anything else about this book that you wanted to share that I haven't asked you about? I'll leave you with one thing because you were talking about aliens and gods. Um Yggdrasil. In Norse myth, Yggdrasil, the world tree, spans existence and holds the worlds in its kind of, uh, in its branches. Um, so I don't use it in, in quite that figurative way. Um, I actually make Yggdrasil a central pillar. You know, they, the Norse would refer to the ash tree as a pillar of the universe. I make it a literal uh, alien intelligence. The if the godhood is real, if there is a, a creature that is that has a claim to be a god, it is this immense arboreal tree-like intelligence that seeded life that originated mankind. So again, I'm taking the Norse myth and I'm playing with it a little bit, and the uh, Yggdrasil sentience and uh, 
uh, its notions of things like the evergreen, which is a pastiche of the internet, um, and the ability to you know, stagger between worlds using uh, thought and memory drive, which is the equivalent of hyperdrive, again, but based on uh, uh, the ravens who get a moon in of, of, of the raven uh, that Odin used to own. So again, playing with Norse myth is just the way to create the believable universe. But again, if there's something that's truly alien and unknowable, um, it is this world spanning tree and when you realize as a culture we really were created by this arboreal intelligence that changes your relationship with the gods um and again it's uh it's too difficult to explain in the context of this you know how that threads through but yggdrasil does play a big part in underpinning the whole uh the whole setting um and there's something called the scream, which is kind of a, the, the, the demise of Yggdrasil um, and people trying to kill it, which is, again, a kind of pastiche of the kind of ecological climate warming stuff that we've got going on here in our world as well. So, again, I like to just play around with those motifs. But Yggdrasil, something worth mentioning because, you know, uh, nature and spirit spirituality were important to the vikings they should be important to anyone who plays the game as well hmm. where can someone uh pick up a copy of when the wolf comes so um vikingverse.com it's a good place to start um Shroud entertainment anywhere on you know the drive through rpg uh if you type in vikingverse into any social media you should be able to find me you should be able to find the website um there's plenty of expansions up on um, Drive Through RPG, like I said, and there are some of the you know I, I held up the book at the beginning, you know the print run, the hefty book that was uh, there's a few copies still sitting on my shelf and with the warehouse as well. Hmm. And um, what is next for for yourself, and what is next for the Viking verse? Yeah, that's a good question, because in theory, I need to do the third novel in the trilogy, but they just take a, a, a while. And writing the RPG actually turned out to be much more fun than writing the novel. So I keep writing more and more uh, supplements. Um, coming out in mid-July um, is an expansion called Death Metal, um, which is a kind of uh, having fun with that kind of Viking heavy metal feel um, of this future world, but also a play on the uh, you know, uranium, um, plutonium, the death metals. It's like a kenning for those. So, you know, introducing uh, nuclear mayhem into when the wolf comes. If you're going to uh, end the world, then you know, one manifestation of the wolf is uh, a shitload of atomic bombs. So, death metal is coming out soon, um, and then after that. You know, you, there's a an old Terry Gilliam um, film called Time Bandits. You've heard Ooh. me talk about all of these temporal paradoxes. There is a, a, a remake of Time Bandits coming out on Apple TV sometime soon, I think. Bandits are just Vikings. So I'm going to mess around with this time stream a bit more. I think I'll probably do some kind of Time Vikings notion. One of the things I like to play around with, again, the history, is... Greek fire, you might be familiar with that. You know, the Byzantines used it to defend Constantinople for many years, but the secret was lost and has never been able to be replicated. And it was lost around 1200. Um, so if, you, if you're if a fan of Game of Thrones and you've seen that green fire that they have, that's a pastiche of, of the original Byzantine Greek fire. Um, it was lost in 1200. If taking the, the kind of premise that I've been talking about that vikings um have altered the timelines uh and they did do what they set out to do and conquer micrograd and they did so in 1040 that puts greek fire in the hands of the vikings because it hasn't been lost as a secret so i like this time vikings idea i like the fact that vikings plus greek fire uh is a legitimate historical thought experiment and i'm going to play around with that as well so if you see uh vikings burning even more things then that will be why 
<laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this amazing book. Um, any last words before we wrap up? No, I'm all good. Thank you for having me on and staying up till uh, God knows when on your Sunday night to listen to me rant on about Vikings. Oh, yeah. This this was a great conversation. And th thank you again for your time. And um, for our viewers, uh, thank you for watching. I will put um, information where you can pick up these books um, in the description below. And uh, stay safe out there. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.